So I'm Nora, and um, I'm just going to give you a bit of background of how Who Cares started. Who Cares Chronicles is uh, the initiative I founded in 2006. Um, we're really in 2007, and I'm going to tell you how it all started, and, and the story behind it is, is kind of compelling, so I hope you guys will enjoy it. Um, and really, I mean, how often do we get to be told stories after the age of 10, really? When you grow up, no one wants to tell you stories anymore. So I'm going to tell you a story. So this is Who Cares? Who Cares started in, in 2006, uh, but in the context of the blockchain, uh, Who Cares for me, blockchain is going to be a tool, and it's going to be, I hope, a very useful tool. Um, it's it's going to be really... Um, a, a game changer. So when I was first asked to speak about this conference, I had different titles that came up to mind. And uh, I thought, oh, blockchain, can it be the promise of a new social conscious? Uh, I am also a writer for Conscious Magazine, which is based in New York and available in 25 countries. Um, so consciousness is a, it's a, it's a large word. Um, what we try to bring or try to to demonstrate to, through Conscious Magazine and Who Cares is how we are all becoming more conscious and more um, uh, aware of how we're, you know, our choices are being made, like what we buy, what we consume, what kind of shows we want to watch, uh, how we live our lives, pretty much. Then I thought of something else. I was like, well, can the blockchain revolution be the dawn of a more caring fashion industry? Because who cares... Um, tries to approach all kinds of industries, not just the fashion industry. But fashion is a big one. Um, it's the second most polluting industry in the world, so obviously there's a lot to do in the caring arena in the fashion industry. And then I wanted to put it into perspective, and I asked myself the last question, which was, can blockchain technology help retailers, designers, and consumers becoming more conscious? So is that possible? So first I'm going to tell you about who cares and how it started, what's the story behind it. So this was the view, actually, I'm going to show you exactly. My office was over here, and that was my view before, I mean, before the sign was on, the Barclays sign was on. That was my view in 2007. So I'm on the 48th floor of uh, 1700 Broadway, and um, Lehman Brothers is uh, my view. And um, the crisis hit, I just moved to New York, just a few months before the crisis hit, and, um, and I'm looking at that, and, and I'm already an expert in CSR, and I'm already looking at ways to change the, the industries, and how can people be more caring. And this was kind of a breakthrough for me, because Lehman Brothers goes down, the staff goes out of the offices with boxes, carton boxes, and most likely evidence, <laughs> they leave the office, and a few weeks later, well, the deal was signed pretty much a few days after that, uh, or even before that, and a few, few days later, um, Barclays gets in, gets the whole building, puts their sign in, and it's business as usual. So we're just going back to the same trading uh, attitudes and, and ways of thinking, and nothing is changing. So... I was obviously um, doing business in New York and I was working with financial institutions, but I was also working with large corporations. And I, I just really, for me, it was a wake-up call. I was like, well, we can't just keep just changing a sign for another and have the same methods of working. Um, the, the little photo underneath the Lehman Brothers um, drooling photo is actually from a painter in New York, and I'll tell you more about it at the end. But I thought it was kind of interesting. It's, it's called the liquidating art. Somebody was talking about art earlier, so that's kind of funny. Liquidating the signs. So this happens, and I say, okay, so I need to go deep into this and figure out what's going on. So I start to make a study, um, and I'm like, I'm just going to go really thoroughly. At the same time that this is going on, so Lehman Brothers goes down, everything's going to, to the dumps, some dude at the same time, partly named Satoshi Nakamoto, comes up with an article and starts speaking about the Bitcoins. I personally wanted to educate myself before I came here. I wanted to really thoroughly research what really Bitcoins were and how they even started and what was the arena of it. So please bear with me as I'm sharing this information, which will be useful as we go on to the presentation. So this, this person, which is kind of funny because when we go back to the blockchain, the industry or the technology as it is, 
It claims that it's fully transparent, yet we can't really trace the founder of it or the guy that started it, which is kind of interesting. So, so at the same time, this is happening, and funny enough, the, the whole blockchain thing starts with the Bitcoin, with the financial institutions again. So we're looking at money, money, finance, finance. But I'm looking more at the caring side of things. That's, that's what Who Cares does. So Who Cares, after the crisis, I go into this long research, and I decide to go and speak to every corporations that we do business with. We deal with investments, and I'm trying to find out how their corporate social responsibility is structured. So I spend extensive amount of time speaking to academics, researchers, um, and CSR professionals within these corporations. And I come to a very clear conclusion. Um, I noticed three things. The first thing is that you have large corporations and a foundation. That's the first model. So whenever a corporation gets to a certain scale, they have a foundation and they very seldomly communicate. Um, they're sort of like two different bodies deciding on their own what's, uh, what's best for the corporation and what's best for the foundation. The second model was a manager or director of CSR within a corporation. And the third model was a marketing or communications director or manager, but I was also handling CSR, corporate social responsibility. And I realized that neither of these three models were working. Um, I realized also that a lot of the great practices, so say, um, you know, a company is using a certain method that's saving a river, is uh, not being shared by a competitor, which is kind of like, you know, uh, a, a something that should be shared, is not being shared. So all the great practices don't have a place. They don't have a platform. You do not know um, what great practices do exist, even sometimes within a company. So they barely even make it to the annual report. So even employees don't even know what good practices they have in, in the carrying CSR arena. So I realized that A, we should have a chief care officer in each corporation, not a manager, not a director, um, a, an executive that could have sort of a transparent approach and would look at every division in every industry and give it scale. So a chief care officer would be the norm. And second, that a platform with great practices should exist so that they should be shared and also duplicated because something that works in the pharmaceutical industry can actually work sometimes in the cosmetic industry and none of these things are being shared. Actually, a lot of these industries don't communicate because, they, well, when I'm in the food business, I don't talk to the guys that do lipstick or I'm in the, I'm in the, the flower business. I don't talk to the guys that do computers which is dubious too, because there's a lot to be shared. So the blockchain can also allow for that, more sharing, more caring. So yes, the Bitcoin, yes, the finance, of course it starts with money and currencies, but, and that's all, usually the way it starts in everything, but I wanted to look at the blockchain as a, as a scalable technology that's so much more bigger than Bitcoin. So, Blockchain is going to change so many things. It's already actually changing so many things. Starting with, I just give you like a few examples of what I thought was interesting in the caring arena. Or as a large scale, what it can do actually to better and make it more, better our world and make it more caring. The first thing I thought was interesting is in the voting. Um, there is a, a startup now called Follow My Vote, which is developing a blockchain based system to ensure security, transparency, and mathematical accurate election results. Some of these uh, technology could have been useful um, recently. Um, power generation, um, that's another, another example that I thought was interesting. There's a, there's a company in Brooklyn uh, that's called LO3 Energy, which runs a project all over Brooklyn where homeowners can buy and sell energy that they have generated with the rooftop solar panels um, and the blockchain allows them to sell their own price, to set their own price, and to do so without a price setting commission taking intermediary. So you can actually produce and sell your own electricity to your neighbor, for example, or exchange something else. Um, another industry that's going to be, yet again, transform is the music streaming. So we just, you know, we all go now on Spotify and uh, Apple Music, and, uh, but there's a new system called Voice. 
uh, with an S, that is enabling artists to set a price of which they receive 100% when a user streams their music. So then again, you have another example of the, how that's going to change. But more in the caring arena, I think um, the healthcare is completely being transformed, notably with something called MedRec, that will integrate with current healthcare computer setups. We also have, which is very important for for the work that I do, because I work with a lot of NGOs. Um, there's a new uh, UN blockchain-based project that is looking to solve issues delivering aid. And um, there's a new uh, pilot food program uh, that helps making pur purchases at a camp supermarket. So it, it allows the consumers to identicate their, their identities with iris scan, and then they can spend um, an allowance that's given to them by the UN at a deducted, at a deducted rate. This cuts down transaction uh, fees for the UN, and it reduces the frequency of fraud and theft. So I think the, the, all the examples of blockchain are so much more broader than Bitcoin. Uh, obviously, we're going to be able to buy a lot of things, but I think we should look at it on a much broader scale on how it's going to change our world, uh, not from the standpoint of, 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 of currency and fashion, but just in everything. I think next to the internet, blockchain is, uh, is going to be a huge disruptor. And now we can get to um, one company that I really uh, feel, um, I felt like if I had money, I would put money into that company. Uh, Provenance, which is a UK startup that has brought, um, they started with agro, but they're also looking into fashion. They, they're doing some work with fashion as well. But they are, um, they are literally changing the game uh, where you can actually source from a fisherman in Indonesia. Um, the, the fisherman is linked to an NGO, so he's authenticated in terms of like his uh, identity, and you can tell where he bought the fish, uh, if there was no bribery involved, how much the price of the fish was, and when you get it, you actually have the whole history of, of, your, of your fish, your tuna, pr precisely, because it's, it's a tuna program. Um, but it, it allows to, to protect these fishermen that live in dire situations. So it's, with the NGO, you actually have a relationship. So blockchain is actually also facilitating the work of NGOs and facilitating the way that we're actually sourcing our products on a large scale. So making our consumption more caring. Now in the case of fashion, because that's where we're here, provenance again um, is, is really breaking that data. So I'm just going to show you a, a thing. I don't know if you will be able to see it very well. but So that's the fisherman. You go to the store, he has his data from his little cell phone, uh, he puts it on, uh, you go to the store, but if you scan the item, it tells you the whole story, like e exactly even when you fished the fish. And it tells you also um, a little storytelling, like if he <laughs> actually caught it at sunset or sunrise, like it actually, you have the whole product. So it gives a whole new meaning to your product. It gives you a different perspective. And I think that's kind of an interesting approach too. We can travel very far, very fast. We have technology at the fingertips, but sometimes you forget. Like, and I had this moment today, which I will share with you. So I want to make this, this interaction as, as personal, as one-on-one -on -one as possible, although we're multiple in the room. But today when we were driving around, uh, we were all in the car, and like, we were multiple uh, per, um, in nationalities. And I was like, this is amazing. We're at the time in history where you can get together from different places of the world. And a few decades ago, this was impossible. But today, we're all in this room, and we are able to share something that is, um, you know, multinational, yet the experience is always different. So this Indonesian fisherman, his life is completely different from our own, but yet blockchain allows me, through just a scan, to understand how his life is. And I think... That is a huge process in terms of the perception that we have towards our products. Um, who cares is has brought has a broader now view. Obviously, we try to identify chief care officers within corporations. But we also try to see how we can enhance empathy in the way that people are making the decisions in the corporations, but also enhance empathy in our consumers. Empathic approach to leadership and consumption is the future too. And I think blockchain is going to allow for that. I hope that's my 
prediction is that blockchain will allow us to be a little bit more empathic about the way that we choose our products. Precisely with this guy. I thought he was, his story was cute. If you look into more into, if you look more into um, provenance, you'll see more about it. But I just wanted to give you a, an idea of the type of companies and startups that we can see rising right now. So, can the blockchain paradigm, which will have an impact like the advent of cell phones or the eruption of the internet, I truly believe that, can it be a vector of change for fashion? So I like to, to, to put it into perspective with the carrying equation. I don't talk about CSR, I, I use the word corporate social responsibility, but I think that carrying and linking it to an emotion is much more impactful. Precisely why? Because when you go and talk to people in an office or talk about CSR, half the time people are like, what, CSR, what is that? Or if you say sustainability or director of environment or like, it's just never so clear. When you speak of caring, it just gives you a whole broader perspective of what really you're trying to achieve. So blockchain is providing key um, illustrations of what corporate social responsibility or caring wants to achieve. They want to achieve transparency, traceability, and responsibility. And that would equal to caring industries. If you, if you all can have implementation of these three components, transparency, traceability, responsibility, for sure you will end up to have a more caring industries um, in, in, in fashion. And in fashion, what this will lead to is the birth of Fashtech, which is uh, obviously more caring because you can have accessible, trustworthy information about the origin, the journey, and the impact, which is huge for us. In, at Who Cares, we really focus on the impact. We just don't want you, I mean, when was the last time you just bought something and said, again, speaking of emotions, we're, uh, we're really adamant about speaking of emotion. When you go to a store, you see something you love, you go, oh, I want this jacket so bad, it will be great for this or that. You don't rarely seldomly think of the impact your purchase is gonna have, but I think blockchain, through scanning, through that kind of information, will allow you to also factor the impact of your item. Um, so it can help create a network of honest businesses and equip them with the tools they need to prove what matters most about their goods, from the source of their ingredients to their impact on environment and society and to their relationship with their customers. That's where it gets very interesting. Because I was talking about storytelling. I don't know so far if the story is pleasing you. But storytelling is key. And, and blockchain will be able to provide that. So fashion plus blockchain, fast tech. We can make that assumption. Or we can intuitively think that this is what it will lead to. Um, it will allow to tracking success of corporate social responsibility initiatives. The issue that we have also is that they, the good practices barely or randomly make it to the annual report, but it's also very hard to find out if the social responsibility campaigns that we see are real. A lot of the times it's marketing, greenwashing, we don't know if it, the source is real, or it's just like fake labeling. Um, so I feel like the blockchain will also be able to um, prevent that and will have much more accuracy in the terms of the social responsibility programs that will be put in place by those companies. So a lot of the companies today, actually, we have to give credit back to us as humans. Let's, let's forget that we're all individuals. But humanity in the last few days, you still have a core group of people that don't care. Actually, the logo, if I go back to the beginning, I don't know if you can see the logo, but anyway. The logo is a question mark and an exclamation point. An exclamation point because a, a lot of people just don't care. Like, we used to, I used to go years and years ago to talk about who cares, and people would say, oh, pfft, people don't care if the t-shirt costs $5 and, you know, it ruined the river or people are working in factories in horrible conditions. Uh, as long as it's $5, they don't care. And then, okay, fine. There, there's a group of people that may feel that way still. They just want the bottom line or they want to... It's possible, but I feel like humanity is evolving towards a more question mark approach where we really want to find out who cares. So that's a question, and we at Who Cares try to do that. We try to identify as many chief care 
officers as possible, with as many practices, good practices as possible, that could be duplicated. And that's what we feature in our website. So you have a whole series of Chief Care Officers and Conscious Magazine on our website, and you also have a lot of great practices that we try as much as we can to validate as we know for sure that they're transparent and real which blockchain possibly will help us, will add on to this. Maybe they'll put me out of business, which will be great. <laughs> if we have transparency, we know that everybody's doing something good, then it's all good. Um, intellectual property, obviously, um, that's a big issue for the fashion industry. Um, blockchain will be able to, I would say above the intellectual property aspects. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see how um, the, the, the design story, what makes the product so compelling. I mean, the intellectual property is the legal aspect of a product. It's the security of a product. It's how you, you make sure that that's my name, that's my brand, that's my logo. But here, the intellectual property will also be able to salvage a story. Sometimes, um, you know, like brands are, are denaturated. They're taken away from their context, context, which is just as damaging as stealing someone's brand and doing um, funny business with it and transforming a product. Uh, I think intellectual property will be salvaged by blockchain, but more importantly, again, trying to look deeper into the side aspects of intellectual property as a broader uh, prospect. The supply chain transparency, obviously that's a huge one for corporate social responsibility and having it, um, having it so, uh, I guess, so blatantly available will make it so much more interesting also for consumers because they will know at every step of the way uh, what can be done. And actually, a few years ago, um, Caring, the conglomerate, the luxury conglomerate, had came up with a, a supply chain transparency system, which was a which was a software, which was allowing to kind of uh, analyze at each step of the production of, a, of an item if there was a faulty um, um, process, and they 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 won a lot of awards for it, and I think they were kind of a breakthrough in this uh, in this. Um, in this arena, but I think blockchain could be very complementary. So again, we're, we're as humans and as a group of consumers, I think we're already seeing the first signals of an interest in being a little bit more in touch with what the planet and people need and want. Um, and this is leading to these, to these um, ethical approach to doing business. And the last part, which is the most interesting for me, I find <clears throat> that the best way to keep a customer interested is to, <clears throat> you have to excuse me because I have a really bad <laughs> throat uh, situation here. Um, the customer experience and storytelling, which is the way that blockchain is going to really transform, I think, the whole uh, experience for, for, um, for fashion, fashionistas and, and consumers. I think now we'll be able to see a lot more of, of these kinds of, of, of um, uh, type cases that I that I've featured here for you. Uh, the first one, uh, I don't know if you can see very well on here, but the first one that I thought was interesting was um, save my wardrobe. Um, a lot of people today, I mean, in in recently, I've heard a lot of people saying, "Well, you should shop your wardrobe. Like you have nothing to wear, just go into your wardrobe and just get something from there. You probably don't even know what's in there." Save your wardrobe is also a um, a startup from the UK that allows you to to um, make your actual items in your wardrobe much more uh, av available in your head, like. The, the way that you go into your wardrobe, you say, well, I have nothing to wear. I didn't think about that. So they have a system that allows you to uh, identify items by use and for a particular occasion. So they, they help out scheme through your items and sort of uh, uh, give a new life to your items. And they're also, like, I think from in the scale of... Um, you know, in comparison to Providence, I think they have an interesting approach. So, so they kind of, like educate you a little bit more to see your wardrobe in a different way so that you shop less or you shop better. Because um, a lot of it, at Who Cares, a lot of it is about um, sh like just having a different relationship to products as well. Uh, we all know that we probably shop too much, 
uh, or not well enough. Sometimes we buy things that we don't need. Uh, and then we're like, well, I shouldn't have bought this. I spent the money on that. So maybe we can just try to optimize our wardrobe and optimize our wallets <laughs> at the same time. Um, another interesting approach that I thought was worthy of, of being, um, being and, and, and by the way, I forgot to mention that this is an app, so you can use it as an app. It's a mobile app. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting. It's, it's, it's sort of like a, what can I compare it to? It's like your own search en engine for your, for your wardrobe. So it identifies all your items, and then you can go through and scheme through it. And it can actually also make recommendations for dry cleaning, alteration, uh, selling, and donating. You can actually also donate whatever you're not using anymore. So I thought it was kind of clever. Save your wardrobe. The second uh, thing that I saw was interesting, which was kind of carrying blockchain and fashion -y, was uh, Baby Ghost. Um, they had uh, last year uh, what they called the Indigo Child Collection. Do you guys know what Indigo Child children are? Anybody? No? Uh, yeah, you know? Okay. But I'll just tell you. The Indigo Child is a new age concept, um, mostly referring to millennials. Indigo children are usually born in the 70, late 70s, 78. And they are very conscious of the planet. They try to save the planet, as a matter of fact. Um, so it's, it is a, a, a new age concept, but it's actually, if you look at millennials and the way that they approach their relationship to the planet and the earth, it kind of makes sense. So they're kind of like dropping hints. Uh, it's very much millennial mentality. So the Indigo Child Collection was definitely a conscious hint or a caring hint. And what they did is that Baby Ghost, which is a young Chinese New York label, they teamed up with Bitsy, a company specialized in the blockchain, and VeChain, an anti-counterfeiting application, to showcase its spring and summer 2017 collection. So VeChain is a cloud product management um, solution, which is, um, that has integrated blockchain technology that puts unique IDs on the blockchain and can verify if an item is genuine or not. Um, so you could verify each piece of the collection, and it could fulfill a bunch of possibilities. So anti-counterfeiting, supply chain management, asset management, and client experiences. So you could actually say like how the, the when you were trying it, how it felt. Um, you could sort of like provide data about how actually the product felt. So you also had as a brand, you were able to tweak a little bit the product in order to make it more interesting. Um, and the VeChain chip embedded inside the clothing, which then tells its story to the consumer. Um, so VeChain can be programmed with photographs, videos, and even personalized information, such as whom it was purchased for and why. So you could even personalize it and say, I bought it for my girlfriend's birthday, and it's a special day for her in this. You could have like a whole story just through that little chip, which was kind of, I thought was a very interesting thing. And then the whole thing about the Indigo Child content, the product was really interesting and compelling because it was really trying to be in line with what um, people want now. Like the collection was very caring and large prospects. It was uh, trying to be more human and uh, the, you know, peer-to-peer -peer relationship with the, from the consumer to the client. They had a very, very interesting uh, approach to it. So I thought that was, that was clever. Another example that I thought was interesting of, of how caring and blockchain and fashion are kind of coming together was uh, Martin Jarglard and Provenance, again, <laughs> Provenance. They obviously did it for agro, but again, they use it also for, for, food, for fashion. Um, Martin Jarglard, she launched a new pilot initiative that uses blockchain technology, and it's distributed in a secure ledger in a bid to enable both transparency and trust around her collections. So um, basically, so each step of the process of her, of her creating process is registered and tracked on the blockchain via the Provenance app. So from the shearing of the British Alpaca fashion farm to spinning at Two Rivers Mill through the knitting at Nister LDN, so, so all the way from the sourcing to the knitting to the factory to the designer studios in London. So all of this creates a digital story uh, of that information, lo including location data, content, timestamps, and all of which is presented to the consumer via an interface they can access through their item's QR code or NFC-enabled label. So 
And it works both on uh, Android and Apple, obviously. But I thought it was interesting how, um, how blockchain and fashion obviously are getting married, but I think the result so far that I've seen that was the most interesting was that it was carrying content that was being created. So we're trying to see if the alpaca as are being treated properly in the in the farm. Uh, we're trying to see how they're being knitted, if the women are being respected, and I thought it was it was kind of a, an interesting uh, utilization of the of the system. Um, the last thing um, that I thought was the most interesting is the storytelling. I don't know if my presentation is very good, but I mean in terms of visibility, but the the, the storytelling is the most important. I think people really want to know, if we want to create a more caring world, a more caring communities, more caring fashion communities, I think the most important is that we really use blockchain for the storytelling. The storytelling is the most important part. Uh, when you, I mean, I, 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 I was listening to the story the other day of, of one of my colleagues who was telling me about what one of her most um, adored item she has in her closet was a dress that she wore that her grandmother made for her at her wedding. And she would tell how her grandmother took such a long time to sew it and how she had to look for certain pieces to make the dress so special, which was for her first dance. And it kind of made me think that what if we had a story like that for each piece of, of clothing that we owned? So um, this woman in India made this sorry for me for this one event or, and usually most of the time, you want to tell a story about this product. Like when people say to you, oh, I love this. Where'd you get this? Oh, I got this in the Ukraine and it was made by this woman that was working in a, you know, the, the storytelling is the most important thing that will make people react differently to an item. When you're buying a shirt that's $5 in a mass market, store, there's no story linked to it. Or if there's a story, you don't want to know about it because it's not a pretty story. So if you want to hear pretty stories, make better products. You just have to be a little bit more conscious. Your story will be beautiful if you care. If you don't, it'll be an ugly story that you will try to hide. But you can't hide it anymore because blockchain is here to bust you out. So you just got to make beautiful stories. <laughs> um, the most important thing also for me, I think that blockchain will make it, uh, which is another beautiful equation, is that blockchain will foster collaborations between NGOs and corporations. Going back to the story, a lot of stories will be told around this con configuration here. The NGOs plus the fashion industry is definitely a smart move because a lot of people in need could benefit from, I mean, if I, I'll give you one more story, which is my favorite story to tell. When I got married, I wanted to have a dress because I, I could hear all my friends in New York, obviously. New York is a big deal. Getting married is a big deal. People make a huge deal about it. I wanted to go the other way. And I sourced and looked for hours, and I found one place, which is called the Bridal Garden. And the Bridal Garden is an NGO. It's a foundation. And it provides uh, a literacy program for children of underprivileged areas in the Bronx. It's an amazing program. And what they do is that they get dresses given from Runway, uh, including Vera Wang, which are couture brands, like a very expensive bridal uh, brand. They give them uh, to the bridal garden, and the bridal garden sells them for a fraction of the cost. Um, so you get a really, really good deal. <laughs> Comes out straight from the Runway, great deal, and all the money goes to this, to this literacy program. That's where I got my dress. The, store, the dress, for me, means very little today because it's not so much the dress that I wanted to wear. I wanted to wear that story. And when people ask me, where'd you get this dress? How did you get it? That's the story I told and that's what people love to hear. They didn't really care much about the dress so much. It was the story. I wanted to know that my dress had an impact. My dress paid for a literacy program in the Bronx. That matters more to me. And I know that today it matters mostly for people. That's what people want. So again, going back to the NGO part, I think that's the observation that I saw that was the most interesting and the most promising is how we're going to be able to link the NGO work foundations with brands. And I think I have to be done. That's the work that we do. We speak about caring everywhere, in schools, at the UN. We have a relationship with Apple in which we do feature chief care officers, mostly in New York, but we're bringing it also to other cities in the world. Um, 
we used to have an app, which I killed. <laughs> we wanted to start with another app, which will measure uh, emotions and how we're reacting to certain products and certain initiatives. Uh, we're working on that. And obviously, we work with a lot of corporations and a lot of them in the fashion industry. And um, that's what we do. We're trying to, uh, it sounds crazy and a little bit uh, utopic, but um, we firmly believe that we are at the time in history where we can make our world more caring, a perfect world. So join us. Inspiration. So uh, thank you for information and the inspiration. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, one question we can... Have if, question. Yes, we have question. Yeah. So... Uh, okay. Sorry, I missed the start of it, um, but I was going to ask, um, <coughs> I don't know if you mentioned it, what's your opinion on Walton Coin? Sorry? What's, that? You, what's your opinion on Walton Coin? I can't hear you. On Walton Coin. Could you please... Uh, yeah, sorry, what's your opinion on Walton Coin? On Walton Coin? Oh, did, did you not? No, I don't know. Okay, yeah. I, I was talking more about blockchain in general, not yeah, so much yeah, currencies. Yeah. I was, okay, yeah. Sorry, because I missed the start, just when you were talking about VeChain. Yes, yes. Kind of, yeah. No, I was talking just about the, uh, the one example with Bitsy and how they yeah, used yeah, yeah. it to make their collection, their one specific collection, okay, cool. a little bit more forward with the technology that yeah, was yeah, provided yeah. by VeChain, indeed, no, yeah. I just, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. speak to you about it later, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>